I was backed into a corner. I had no other options. My options were the chemo wasn't working, uh, try this second clinical trial or do nothing. And uh, it was, I, I didn't even consider do nothing. Uh, after the success I had with the first one, uh, and like I say, I fully trusted him. And uh, now it's, you know, I'm in my sixth year uh, since my diagnosis going to, it'll be six years shortly. And I'm still here. This is the James Cancer Free World Podcast. I'm Steve Wartenberg. Thanks for joining us. This is the first of a special series of extra podcasts featuring Samik Roy Chowdhury, a James physician, scientist, and the originator of several clinical trials that incorporate precision cancer medicine, genetics, big data, and immunotherapy, and are really pushing the needle forward. Samik has been a guest on this podcast several times over the past few years, and we've talked before and after we record and also during our Pelotonia rides, and we came up with the idea to do a series of podcasts on specific clinical trials that Samik and his lab have led, and to include one of the patients from each of these trials. We're starting our series today with Robert Bioni, who was kind enough to drive up from his home in Cincinnati with his family to share the story of his cancer journey, which started six years ago when he was first diagnosed with pancreatic cancer. Bob was eventually referred to Samik and his team here at the James, and he has participated in two clinical trials that target the specific genetic mutation that led to his pancreatic cancer. These clinical trials have proven to be really effective, and I don't think it's an exaggeration to say they have saved Bob's life. Welcome, Samik, and welcome, Bob. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, it's always great to hear and learn from a cancer patient about your journey. So, But first, just tell us a little bit about you and your family. And I know because you told me a little, you have had a, you had a really interesting career before you retired. Yeah. Um, well, going back, I have a family history of cancer. Uh, my dad had prostate cancer. His brother had prostate cancer. My mom died of lung cancer. Uh, I had prostate cancer about 12 years ago, but I'm cured of that. Uh, I'm currently uh, 75 years old. When I was diagnosed, I was 69 years old, and uh, life was good. My wife and I had just celebrated our 50th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Had a big party, 100 people. Wow. Had an Elvis Im imitator there who <laughs> uh, sang, I can't. Uh, stop loving you while we danced and it was great a uh, great family I have uh, two boys two daughters-in-laws four grandkids everything was wonderful well in 2017 my world crashed that was a terrible year for me our anniversary was in December 2016 two months later uh, I started having abdominal pain one evening it was actually February the 15th day after Valentine's Day um, took some ibuprofen, uh, went to bed, didn't help, woke up, uh, the pain had radiated around to my upper back, and I had nausea and couldn't eat. I told my wife, something's wrong. I went to the ER. Um, they had originally thought maybe it was a gallbladder problem, and further tests showed that it was pancreatic cancer. Uh, needless to say, we were just shocked, and devastated. Um, why me? You know, it's a, such a rare cancer. And I knew just from what I'd seen in the past, uh, the survival rates were really low. Right away, I thought of famous act actors, actresses, and people that had it and died. Um, and uh, we actually had a person in our family, my daughter-in-law's sister, found out she had it, and I think she died maybe a month later. Wow. So it was uh, horrible. Um, I uh, started, uh, uh, I, I talked to an oncologist that the hospital referred me to, and uh, he referred me to a surgeon, and I wound up having uh, robotic surgery, what started out to be a Whipple procedure, and it wound up, there was more cancer in my pancreas than just the head of the pancreas, so they took out the whole pancreas. I woke up from a, about a nine-hour surgery, 
and now I was a diabetic on top of it. Because your pancreas was removed. Because I had no pancreas. And uh, so uh, uh, that was uh, the start of it. And um, since then, uh, well, after that, I had six months of chemo. Uh, I went into remission. And uh, after about maybe four months or so, a CT scan showed the cancer had returned. Uh, I started um, having uh, uh, chemo again in Cincinnati, where I live, and um, there was maybe three or four months, and uh, my oncologist told me that uh, it wasn't working. Luckily, my oncologist, Dr. Mark Johns, was a uh, graduate of OSU, and he was familiar with a lot of their trials, and he told me... uh, about a trial that he'd read about that Dr. Rochattery had going on, a clinical trial that was for cancers with FGFR mutations, which is what I had. And the way he explained it to me, a FGFR mutation is something that causes cancer cells to grow abnormally, and the chemo is not as effective. So he asked me if I would mind uh, checking into it and driving up to Columbus, and I said, by all means. Um, so that's how I... I kind of got in with uh, Dr. Rochattery. It sounds like due to your family history, you may have been prepared for prostate cancer, which you had and yeah. did well, knock on wood. Yeah. But then you get this second diagnosis out of the blue that it, it it's like, I thought I already beat cancer and here it is again. I mean, that's just devastating. It was terrible. It was like, you know, why me? Uh, yeah. I why was me telling Dr. Rochattery earlier at the time, I... I looked it up, and uh, the the article I read said one in fifty thousand patients or, or people will get pancreatic cancer. I looked it up the other day, and now it says one in sixty three thousand something. So you can see how it's increased in that six years. Um, but yeah, I didn't know anyone uh, who uh, at the time had uh, had it, and uh, I just thought it was a death sentence. Yeah. Um, Well, Samik, what was going on in Bob's body, this FGFR, genetic mutation, kind of what is it and what was happening in his pancreas? So first of all, patients like Mr. Bioni are the heroes of cancer research. They come to us to participate in clinical trials with great uncertainty Even I can't tell him what's going to happen. We have great hope uh, in the design of the therapy, but he's the hero of the research. So like he said, the fibroblast growth factor receptor is a gene or family of genes, and we've recently learned uh, that they can be found in pancreas cancer. We first started studying these in around 2010 uh, in various cancer types, perhaps liver cancer and bladder cancer, are more often the cancers we think of when we think of the FGFR genes. It was really rare for us to meet a patient with pancreas cancer, uh, and and Mr. Bioni is one of four that I've met over the past eight years or so. Mm. Uh, And Mm. thankfully, when we met him, we had a a new clinical trial that we had developed for a drug that could target the mutation in FGFR and try to treat the cancer. So if the FGFR gene was allowing the cancer to grow and cause its trouble, we could try to target it with this smart drug, which is a pill that he takes every day, uh, to inhibit it, turn it off, and prevent the cancer cells from growing. So everyone has FGFR gene in their body, but it's when it starts to grow uncontrollably, that's the issue, and that's what was happening in his pan- pancreas. That's right. It's a normal gene in, in physiology, and it helps us you know, with... with skin care and you know eye uh, eyelashes and things but if it has a mutation that you're not supposed to have in the cancer cells well it gives cancer cells in our body a competitive advantage and it's growing with this gene it's invading and causing trouble which is what cancer does by invading other organs uh, but it's only found in the cancer cells so it's not oh, something it's, oh, that we're oh, born okay. with necessarily it's a newly acquired mutation in our body only in those pancreas cells that are cancerous. And as the cancer cells grows, 
the FGFR mutation grows along with it. Right. There are all the cancer cells. Each cancer cell in the body has the FGFR mutation. Is there, is, is it known what causes this mutation? Is it uh, environment, cigarette smoke, diet? It's a very good question. Most of the time for FGFR genes, we think it's spontaneous. It's just the, the random errors that happen mm. when you copy six billion letters trillions of times in our body. So, so every time DNA is copied in our body, there's about a one in a hundred million error rate. And, and there are some cancers where environmental exposures such as tobacco and smoke uh, can cause damage to DNA. Ultraviolet radiation is another example. Right. But in this instance, uh, like many other cancers that are not smoking related, uh, it's really spontaneous. It's, it's the natural error rate when you copy DNA. It's, it's like if I were to ask you to copy the telephone book hundreds of times, I think you'd get pretty bored but, and you'd make some mistakes. And, and those are the mistakes we see in FGFR. So it's interesting, even though Bob is unique from someone else, they can have the same FGFR mutation spontaneously. They could live thousands of miles away and lead completely different lives. It's spontaneous, but yet somehow a pattern. So the reason we designed the trial, uh, it was meant for any cancer type because we had learned that you could find the FGFR gene mutation in various cancer types. So we could find it in liver cancer where we first studied it, but we were starting to see it in uterus cancer. We were starting to see it in stomach cancer and in this instance, pancreas cancer. So how could we get a therapy to patients based on a gene but it would be found in various cancer types. So we had to break the mold. Up until that point, most clinical trials that were being designed were for a cancer of an organ. So for example, a clinical trial for breast cancer, a clinical trial for lung cancer. So we flipped the, the model and we targeted the gene and we said it could be for any type of cancer patient if they have that gene. And that's the trial that he participated in. Wow. So before we get too much further into this trial, Bob, what was it like you get this referral to this doctor you've never heard of? You drive up mm -hmm. an hour or two to Columbus and you meet with Samik. And I'm guessing there's some, someone, some other people from your team there in the room. What's that meeting like? What did he tell you? How did you walk out of that room? Well, I went in there feeling kind of hopeless. And by the time my wife and I left, I felt, and we both felt, very optimistic. Um, we saw, I don't know how many people up there. First, I had to qualify for the study, and it was about two days of testing. But once I got uh, to Dr. Rochattery's office there, and it started with the person downstairs that checks you in at the reception desk. Every single person was just wonderful. They just treated you so nice. Um, I saw uh, nurses, nurse practitioners, medical assistants, uh, research assistants. I, I can't. I think one day I counted that I saw close to ten people. Uh, some of the research assistants brought in other people, and every single one of them just made you feel at ease. And then I, I meet uh, uh, Dr. Rochowdery and. As you can see what he's talked about so far, he talks to you in common terms that you understand and uh, uh, gave me a lot of hope, both of us. I, I felt really comfortable and fortunate to have been uh, taken into the study by the time I left there. Yeah. Now, you mentioned your wife came with you, so it's always important to have a second set of eyes and ears. And today, your wife came with you along with your two sons. Yes. Mm -hmm. I've been talking to so many people. Having that family support is uh, pretty important. I'll tell you, it is. I've been so lucky um, to, to have uh, such a great family, and the support they've given me has been uh, fantastic. Uh, talking about my son, say... Take, take turns driving me up here um, every time I have an appointment. And one time, even my daughter-in-law drove me up. Um, the other thing, not only family, but I think it's real important uh, if you have whatever type of cancer it is to uh, be open about it to not only your family, but your friends and your neighbors, your church. 
because I was amazed after, you know, we didn't hide anything. We told our neighbors, my neighbors have been great. They, they offered to go to the grocery store, shovel snow, cut grass, anything like that. Our parish has been great. The parish nurse calls me regularly to check up on me. And so I think it helps having all these people not hiding it. And uh, because you're, you'll be amazed if you do that, the support that you get from people. Yeah, people want to help. They do. They and, really and make, do. Yeah. yeah. So, so Sameek, Bob comes in. He qualifies for this clinical trial. So walk us through the clinical trial, the drug that he was administered, and, and how it worked. And then, Bob, you'll fill us in on sort of the, the if there were any side effects and how you felt. Okay. Yeah, so the first study uh, that we were on uh, was with a drug called panatinib. And it was actually a drug developed for leukemia and for a different gene target. And so this was in the early days of FGFR therapy. And so we sort of repurposed this drug in in a clinical trial and it was working. It was helping patients with FGFR positive cancer. And so uh, obviously we're standing here now, it, it helped control the cancer. The tumor markers decreased. Uh, it did come with some side effects. Uh, but I think compared to chemotherapy, uh, I, I think the, the balance of the risks and benefit were pretty good. And um, importantly, though, we started to realize that his cancer was sensitive to this early drug for FGFR. Uh, and as the, the trial was coming to an end for him, uh, and we had to come up with another option with chemotherapy, uh, I, I was careful to tell him, there will be more therapies ahead of you. So, th- so your cancer is very sensitive to FGFR. Uh, I, I'm confident chemotherapy is going to help you because that's been our experience. Uh, when someone does well with an FGFR drug, they can often go on, go on to chemotherapy, even a chemotherapy they've had before, and it can become sensitive again. And sensitive means it could come back? It, it could treat the cancer effectively. Oh, okay. Yeah, so even if you've had chemotherapy and it stopped working... If you do well on an FGFR drug, you can actually go back to the same chemotherapy oh, okay. and it can become effective again. Uh, and I think it was effective for mm-hmm. us for you know, longer than a year uh, with Dr. Johns, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So panatinib, if I'm pronouncing it close yep. to correctly, is the drug. How did you know that this drug that was used for a different type of cancer was going to work against FGFR. I know it's not a guess that there was actual yeah. research and you had a very high certainty that it was going to work. Yeah, there was laboratory data in, in you know cells in, in the laboratory that were FGFR mutant, and there, was, were, there were cancer cells that were not FGFR mutant, and panatinib was active against these cell lines. And so that was the purpose of that first clinical trial that we had designed uh, and we were offering it to patients with FGFR positive cancer. Uh, and then as that trial was happening, drug development was catching up. So there were now drugs that are more selective for FGFR. Um, most drugs that we have for cancer actually do more than one thing. Uh, so those come with you know, potential side effects, uh, but they could also come with benefits, right? And so the, the first drug built for leukemia was now helping us for FGFR. Bob, describe what was going on in your body in terms of if there were any side effects and what what you thought was going on with your cancer. You know, that's been a while, and I was sitting here trying to think. I don't remember any significant side effects. Um, I um, uh, I think you had some dry skin. <laughs> dry, dry skin, uh, but uh, not the dry eyes like I'm having currently with the new drug. But uh, it was dry skin. And um, Bob's not someone who complains. Gosh I think darn! It. <laughs> uh, there was something else. Um, I'm trying to remember, wasn't anything real significant? No, uh, I think you did really well with that. Yeah, is yeah. that nor? I know it's a new drug for a new use, but is that pretty normal? Yeah. So panatinib, when it's used in leukemia, patients can take it for years and and, and tolerate it pretty well. So the side effect profile was, was pretty good, uh, which is one of the other advantages of of that trial. Now. You also said, I think, that that there's a possibility this drug will, will work for a while, but not maybe not long term. So what we've learned about FGFR is that while it can be sensitive to a smart drug that tries to turn it off, it can evolve. And so 
with new mutations, it can become resistant to an FGFR inhibitor or drug. And so that's why drug development and our partnerships with pharma are allowing us to bring new FGFR inhibitors or smart drugs uh, so we can try to treat the same patients with a better therapy. So, Bob, you knew that, that this is working now, Mm -hmm. but this down the road, um, there could be problems. Yeah, yeah. I felt, you know, the, uh, what's the way I want to put it, the risk is worth it. Um, Yeah. um, And I was doing real well. I just thought of maybe another little side effect, uh, a fever. Uh, They said you could have a fever. One time I had a low-grade fever, and they were very concerned whenever you would go over 100 degrees, I think. Mm -hmm. And mine was maybe 101, and I wound up going to the emergency room, and they treated it there and got it down. And I never had a fever again after that. Um, But um, other than that, I, I think that was about the only ongoing or the only side effects that I can recall from that. But, yeah, I knew that, you know, someday... I may wind up going back to another type of uh, treatment like chemo or something. How do you do that in terms of just getting on with your life and not being anxious? Do you just try to live every day and not worry oh, about it? Or I, We say that all the time. You live one day at a time. Um, yeah. That's an ongoing expression with uh, me and my wife. Um, You've been be, doing that for a lot of days now. Yeah, because you're good. up and down. I mean, there there are days where maybe you have low energy. Yeah. Um, and, you know, and you just deal with it. And, but, uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely one day at a time. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, Samik and Bob will tell us what happened when his pancreatic cancer did come back and how fortunately there was a second clinical trial available. You didn't choose cancer, but you can choose where to treat it. And when you choose the James at Ohio State, you're picking a team of experts who understand there is no routine cancer. You're opting for care from a highly specialized team dedicated to treating one type of cancer, yours. A team that studies the unique makeup of your disease to develop a personalized treatment plan. You're choosing our region's only comprehensive cancer center designated by the National Cancer Institute. Where more than 1,700 scientists are working on new treatments and new hope for every form of cancer. At the James, you're making the choice to have the most advanced treatments, many of which were developed right here. And you're choosing access to the James world-class clinical trials, dedicated support services, and an unmatched survivorship program to support your life after cancer treatment. You didn't choose cancer, but the choice of where to treat it is clear. We're back with Samik Wright Chowdhury and Bob Bioni. And Bob, so the first clinical trial went well for a while, and then what led you to believe or to find out that it, it hadn't. It had stopped working f- effectively, and your cancer was back. Well, uh, at at the while I was getting the first clinical trial, I'd been getting it for I think about maybe fifteen months or something like that. And uh, Dr. Rashadri orders regular CT scans, and he showed me the most recent one, and the cancer had gone from being stable to uh, progressing. Um, so he. Um, told me that going back to one of his original suggestions to stop this drug, the trial drug, return to Cincinnati, go on chemo, uh, stay in touch with him, um, and um, at such time where another clinical trial comes up for FGFR mutations, I could maybe qualify for that one. Uh, So that's what I did. I took it for, uh, I went to Cincinnati, I was on the chemo for, I believe it was 18 months and it was stable. And then all of a sudden it started progressing again. Dr. Johns referred me back up here and it just so happened that he had the second clinical trial, Dr. Richowdery, um, and that's the one I'm in now. So Samik, the pancreas is removed totally. So how does the cancer come back? Well, so the, the cancer had metastasized okay, when it had right. recurred. That's what I thought. And so that's the disease that we've been treating. 
And you know, now that it had been growing despite the 18 months of chemotherapy, uh, we talked about a new FGFR drug. So, so this time around, the clinical trial is a FGFR that's a little more focused than panatinib. Uh, this drug is called infragratinib. Uh, and it's been better studied in liver cancer and bladder cancer. And again, in our study, we're reaching out to patients with a variety of cancer types, including pancreas cancer. The idea being we think it's genetics driven, right? If we treat patients based on the genetics of their cancer, not just where it came from. And fortunately, we were able to qualify uh, and get started on the treatment. And I was very, very impressed with the response we've had uh, we, we've seen spots in, in the lung disappear almost. Uh, we've seen the blood marker decrease from around 2000s uh, to 40 or so. Uh, and, and so we've gotten a really good response. Uh, and then once again, you know, we've treated it. I don't think we've gotten rid of it. And I'll say the same thing again. If, if it were to start growing again, we'd probably go back to another mix of the chemotherapy. And then we'll wait again for another development for new FGFR drugs, uh, because that's what we're doing in the, in the lab. So, so our mission is to bring patients hope with new therapies, uh, and not only is the research inspired by our patients, but it's gonna come back, right? We can take this finding to the laboratory, learn about drug resistance, partner with pharma to develop new drugs, uh, and, and so our goal again is to bring hope with new therapies. Now, speaking of hope, Bob, so, when it came back after the first clinical trial and then the chemo and you're getting ready to go on your second clinical trial with infogratinib i think that was close what is how are how are you handling that what's what's your mindset what are you thinking um well i again i had complete confidence in this guy sitting next to me um i knew that uh he wouldn't recommend it if he didn't think it would help me. And uh, obviously the uh, chemo in Cincinnati had uh, plateaued. So um, there was another clinical trial in Cincinnati, but uh, uh, Dr. Richowdery and Dr. Johns discussed it and they decided that this was my best option coming up to the James. And so I've been in this current clinical trial for just about a year now. Um, and doing real well. It's, as he said, you know, about the tumor markers and the spots on the lungs and things like that. And overall, I feel good. Uh, you know, there's ups and downs, but I've been doing real well so far. Yeah, and you, meant, you both mentioned spots on the lungs and markers in the blood. So when it metastasized, where did it go and where has it sort of shrunken away from? In this instance, it had metastasized to spots in the lung and some lymph nodes. And so we can do CAT scans to measure those tumors. Uh, we presume they're all from the pancreas cancer, and then they all have the FGFR gene. It's all the same type of cancer. And it's sort of spread, yeah. and each one of them can evolve, too. Uh, and, and so we, we use the scans and markers uh, to determine how we're doing. And that's how we'll also know if it's not working, and that will help us decide what to do. Um, I think one of the, the things about clinical trials uh, is that it really takes a lot of support. So there's lots of extra things that we've gone through together. Uh, you know, I, I can't tell you how many eye exams you've been through, <laughs> uh, how many CAT scans, how many EKGs. You can probably do EKGs on me now that we've done them so many times. Uh, but as well as the family support. So bringing you from Cincinnati to Columbus has been critical. Uh, but that's also one of the things that we're looking ahead and into the future, uh, trying to think about bringing access to a clinical trial for patients so they don't have to travel. Uh, and so you know, with telemedicine, which is how we stayed in touch between the two studies, uh, that, that's an opportunity for us to you know, create access for patients, uh, eliminating certain travel barriers and geography barriers. Oh, Samik, that was a seamless segue into our ne my next question, which is about the follow-up to this, because you mentioned at the beginning that, that 
Bob and people like him who are in clinical trials are the heroes because you learn more and it leads to the next clinical trial, which pushes the needle forward. And that happened with Bob and with, and with this clinical trial. So explain what you learned and how you're now going to use that with telemedicine to help people all over the country and maybe even the world. Well, I can't say it enough. Patients are the hero of cancer research, the heroes of cancer research. And over the past eight years, I've met four patients with pancreas cancer with the FGFR gene. Each of them has done well with therapy. We currently have another patient uh, who travels from Florida, uh, and we see him by telemedicine. Hmm. And so the new idea that we propose uh, is to offer FGFR targeted therapy or smart drug therapy an oral therapy, and to reach patients through telemedicine throughout the country. So we could potentially reach patients in Alaska, California, Maine, and Florida with pancreas cancer who have this FGFR gene. So we're, we want to share this finding. So this will be a manuscript that we publish so other researchers, other oncologists start to become aware that pancreas cancer, if it has this FGFR gene, could be very sensitive to the therapies that we have for FGFR today. And I'm not sure that pancreas cancer doctors are aware of this finding. And so that's part of the research. And again, it wouldn't have happened if we didn't have four brave patients enter studies with uncertainty, traveling to come to Ohio State and the James to do these studies. And now, one, we can help them with the new therapies we're developing. Uh, and two, we're going to reach more patients and hopefully help them as well. So you've identified the FG, FGFR and you've identified a drug that's really effective against it. You're starting with patients with uh, pancreatic cancer. Can there, be, uh, can there be, are you working on other clinical trials for different types of cancer with that FGFR mutation? Well, one of the, the topics that we are working on is discovering the types of FGFR gene mutations that we can treat. And so there are a couple that we know in pancreas cancer that are sensitive to the drug. And so we've partnered with some diagnostics companies to look at hundreds of thousands of tumors, look at thousands of FGFR mutations, and then we're trying to classify them. We're trying to prove whether they are functional and sensitive to the FGFR drugs. So our goal is to help define which FGFR gene mutations can we treat. And if we can do that, we can include them in our upcoming clinical trials and hopefully then reach more patients as well. So there's not just one FGFR mutations, there's multiple, right. which is always the why cancer is so complicated. Yeah, there's four FGFR genes, and they each have a variety of mutations, probably over 200 different mutations now that I know can be yeah. treated. Wow. But we think there are more, and so we're trying to discover and characterize those. Uh, and, and we have the, the, the fortune of having a multidisciplinary team to do that. And so treating patients like Mr. Bioni is not just about me as an oncologist. Uh, there's a team behind me, uh, computer scientists, genetic scientists, diagnostic specialists. Uh, all of these people come together to identify the problem, solve it, and then bring it back to patients. Yeah, you have a lab of about 12 or 13 people who are all working on Bob's cancer. <laughs> and, and this is the why. Yeah. This is why we do what we do. To be able to sit here next to him and talk about it. Exactly. Yeah. So, Bob, uh, Samik used the word hero, which I agree with him. Do you consider yourself a hero? Well, I'm, I'm really glad if I could do anything that would maybe save one patient in the future. Uh, but no, no, I don't. I mean, I, I was backed into a corner. I had no other options. My options were the chemo wasn't working, uh, try this second clinical trial, or do nothing, and uh, it was I, I didn't even consider do nothing uh, after the success I had with the first one. Uh, and like I say, I fully trusted him, and uh, now it's you know I'm in my sixth year uh, since my diagnosis. Going to it'll be six years shortly, and I'm still here. Well, that 
is the heroic part to me in some in some oh, sense thank you. of day after day dealing with what cancer brings to your life and not giving in and being optimistic and living for each day which yeah. which you've done so that's to me the example you I'm sure you're setting for your family and friends mm. I hope so well thank you both this has been really interesting and as I mentioned this is going to be the first of a series in which Samik will tell us about a very unique clinical trial that he and his team have initiated and will include a patient because, as you said, Sami, patients are the heroes and their stories need to be told and inspire others. So thank you both. Thank you for having me. Thank you. This podcast is brought to you by the Ohio State University Comprehensive Cancer Center, Arthur G. James Cancer Hospital, and Richard J. Solov Research Institute. For more information, check out our website, cancer.osu.edu.